Well, I think we'll go ahead and get started. My name is Chris Barkin. Uh, welcome to the virtual William W. Hay Railroad Engineering Seminar. Before I introduce our speaker today, I'd like to remind listeners that you can ask questions using the question box on the side of your screen, and one of the moderators of the seminar will read them to our speaker at an appropriate time. The William W. Hay Railroad Seminar Series is sponsored by the Rail Transportation and Engineering Center here at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And on behalf of all of us here uh, at the University of Illinois, we thank AAR, BNSF, CN, Hanson Professional Services, and Union Pacific for your ongoing support of Railtech. It is greatly appreciated by those of us here on campus, as well as all of those uh, who are able to participate via the internet. I'd like to extend a welcome to the more than 180 people who registered for this seminar from at least four different continents around the world. This list includes representatives from freight and passenger railroads, transit organizations, federal and state DOTs, engineering firms, universities, research organizations, technology developers and suppliers, and others. We're very pleased that you can join us for what will be an interesting, a very interesting presentation. Those of you who wish to receive PDHs for your participation, uh, please send us an email at payseminar at illinois.edu, and that information is also in the seminar announcement, and um, uh, you'll be able to receive your, your credits for participating today. This will be our final Hay Seminar for the fall semester, but we're already lining up speakers for next semester and plan to resume in early February, so please stay tuned. Anyone with even cursory knowledge of North American geography is aware of the substantial chain of mountains that separates the Midwestern section from the Pacific coast. The rich natural resources of the West Coast region combined with the ports in the US and Canada that serve as gateways to the Pacific maritime trade routes to the Far East mean that a railroad that could gain access to the West Coast had lucrative potential traffic. However, the Rockies are the most formidable mountain barrier in North America and any railroad wishing to access the West uh, first had to traverse them. And in every case doing so required significant civil engineering surveying, analysis, planning, engineering, and construction to achieve their goal. In many cases, the original routes left a lot to be desired in terms of grade and efficient economic operation. So subsequent efforts have been directed at improving route alignment. The Canadian Pacific Railway was no exception and they have undertaken several major reconstruction efforts to improve their original route since it was first constructed in the latter 19th century. There have been multiple chapters in this saga, and our speaker today will discuss CP's latest project and some of the new technologies being used to accomplish this. Our speaker today is David Thurston. He has been involved in railway and rail transit systems engineering for over 40 years. He completed his BS in Electrical and Computer Engineering at Clemson University, his MS in Electrical and Computer Engineering at George Mason University, and a PhD in the School of Engineering at Temple University. He is currently Chief Engineer Train Control for Canadian Pacific Railway. He is a registered professional engineer in eight states and one province, an honorary fellow and chairman of the North American Section of the Institution of Railway Signal Engineers, a senior member and elected board member of the Vehicular Technology Society of the IEEE and previously served as vice president of the Land Transportation Division of BTS. He's a life member of ARIMA where he currently serves on three committees for manuals of standard practice and is also actively involved with a number of AAR advisory groups and committees related to train control. He has more than 45 railway papers and presentations with particular focus on train control and related topics. I'm very pleased to introduce my friend, Dr. David Thurston, who will present Canadian Pacific and the challenges of crossing the Canadian Rockies. Well, thanks, Chris. Right, David. Can you all see my screen now? I hope you can. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. All right. Um, as Chris said, I'm, I'm Dave Thurston, uh, Chief Engineer of Training Control for Canadian Pacific. And I'd like to talk a little bit about the history and the future programs that we have uh, for our, our main line that crosses the Rockies here in Western Canada. As Chris mentioned, um, 
the original construction of the main line west um, really came about very quickly. Um, it was an, an intent to join the country to bring British Columbia into the, into the Union of Canada. And uh, the biggest obstacle, of course, was the, uh, the Rocky Mountains between uh, Calgary and Vancouver. There were several routes were picked. Um, the one that was eventually picked was actually surveyed and discovered in 1882, just a few years before actual construction was completed for the entire line. The reasons for that, picking that line was, was, was more as much political as anything else. It was closer to the United States and that was thought to prevent the U.S. road from building a line into Canada and, and taking traffic from the Canadian railroad. Um, and it's also 200 miles shorter than any other line that was surveyed, which tended to be one of the driving factors as well. But the original line, as Chris mentioned, was built at low construction costs rather than low operating costs. And with that came the realization immediately in the first winter of operation of the Rogers test uh, in, in uh, Eastern British Columbia that the snow and the avalanche danger was so great that in most cases, uh, the winter operation was suspended. The first thing CP did was to build snow sheds. Uh, as you can tell, by 1904, we had, had constructed over 5.6 miles of sheds at 54 locations. And that's just on Rogers Pass alone. There's still a lot of snow sheds out in Western Canada, but this is just over the line over Rogers Pass. And you've heard some discussions on railways that they, you know, so through mountains as opposed to over them, well, this line went over the mountain. There weren't really that many tunnels to speak of, and it was a very steep grade. And uh, the Rogers Pass was a very uh, difficult and physical to the operation of the railway. But CP realized soon that the snowsheds weren't enough. Um, the maintenance and construction and looking after these snowsheds was considerable. We still had to run out the trains and, and we still had trouble keeping the line open all some all winter long. There was a series of, of uh, line relocations and major projects to combat this situation. And I'd like to go through a few of them right now just to give you an idea of how long this has been going on in CT and how we continually increase the capacity of the line as well as uh, increase its reliability over, over, over the mountains. One of the first projects was in 1902 on the Outer Tail Sub. That's just west of Field, British Columbia. Uh, the existing grade at the time was four and a half percent. It required pushers uh, at several locations. And this line relocation um, actually took uh, double the, the distance in travel, the train of travel, in order to cut the grade down to uh, an acceptable uh, level so that we didn't have to use pushers anymore coming out of field. Another one was the Falter Tunnel. This is a little bit further west of the Otter Tail sub that I mentioned before. This alignment was actually originally through an earthen tunnel that was uh, not very stable, it actually finally collapsed. Uh, the temporary diversion that lasted actually a few years until the line was relocated uh, had such severe curves that the passenger trains had to chain their couplers together because the curvature is so restrictive, it would actually break free on several occasions. So it was really not a very good operating scenario for the CP. The final uh, alignment that was in service and it's still in service today is the new Hollister Tunnel, uh, built in 1905, 1906. It's fully concrete lined and was um, listed to the test of time. One of the more um, uh, noticeable projects that CP undertook uh, was the spiral tunnels. Um, if you can see my cursor on the screen here, the original line followed the Kicking Horse River all the way down straight through to Field. This is on the east side of Field. Uh, it consisted of several four and a half percent grades downhill and emergency safety switches that would be manned by personnel that would throw the switch in case the train was out of control or going too fast. These spiral tunnels were designed after things that were done in, in the mountains of Europe, where trains would 
keep to a higher elevation initially, uh, fold under it itself, travel back the other direction into another spiral cone and get uh, back into the valley to this field bridge Columbia. Again, this was uh, to eliminate pusher districts um, and operate the trains through in a much higher rate of speed because you can stop the assigned pushers and so on and so forth. But you could tell from some of the graphics here that the old line would require four engines to haul 710 tons of freight, and the new line would only take two to haul 980 tons. So this is a huge improvement uh, back in the day, and this was done in, in just after the turn century as well. So you can tell that CP has been busy for many years improving the operation and trying to uh, reduce transit times for the freight trains going over the mountains. Uh, starting in 1910, another great separation project was uh, started, but this was a, a much larger scale than what was done before. This was the Connaught Tunnel Project. And as you can see from the graphic on the side here, the blue line indicates the original line over Rogers Pass. The new line includes the 5.03 mile long Connaught Tunnel through Mount McDonald. And it cut off quite a bit of track um, on the line as well as eased the grades from 2.2% to 1% and allowed this double track new section to actually eliminate and abandon the original Rogers Pass line. So all of those miles and miles of snowsheds that were over Rogers Pass and um, all of the locations we could eliminate altogether. And of course, the tunnel itself provided a, a, a huge amount of protection from the snow and avalanches that were occurring. Construction ran from 1913 to 1916. Um, and it came in within budget and was a year early in, in time frame. Um, and that sounds hard to believe in some respects, but uh, reality of life was that they had cut out quite a bit of scope out of the project and allowed that to happen. Some of these things included lining the entire tunnel. That was never done in the original construction. That later proved to be a, a fairly costly mistake. It was also originally planned to be electrified. And as such, there was no ventilation system supply for the tunnel. It was, however, double tracked through the tunnel, but not all the sections that were to be double tracked were in fact double tracked through the tunnel. And you can see here in this photo is the um, new system. Uh, this structure on top of the portal was uh, installed a year or two after the introduction of the tunnel to provide ventilation in the tunnel. And the housing up here is, is for the uh, personnel that manned the, the engines that ran those tunnels and those uh, fans themselves. It was an interesting situation where these tunnels, uh, as being five miles long, required some ventilation with steam engines. And so that structure was created to create a ventilation system for it. You can see right here, there's two squirrel cage fans. And we'll get into that just a little bit more. With two large diesel engines on either side that ran on bunker sea oil. Uh, which is obviously needs to be heated. So there's also a steam plant and you can see some of the smoke from that to heat that oil and allow the engines to run with their full capacity. This is what it looks like today, a little bit more overgrown and a little bit more weed infested than I think most people would like to say. But you can say, you see here is the squirrel cage fan. There's two of them. Uh, because of the traffic density right now, uh, with the prominent direction of trains handling downhill in the tunnel. We don't need a lot of ventilation, so we only use one of the two fans at any one time. And uh, they're fairly large fans, um, with 12 foot three inches in diameter. And these fans here rotate, bring in air from here, and bring it down to the floor of this structure, which is right here. And there's a, there's a false lining in the tunnel for the first 100 feet. It's uh, lined in wood. And that air is pumped into the air into the tunnel portal that way to allow the ventilation to occur. Since this is the bottom of the tunnel, the air flows uphill, and therefore we can ventilate the tunnel properly. This is what currently looks like inside uh, the emergency diesel uh, for the Canal Tunnel ventilation system. 
there are several changes that have occurred over time. Uh, I mentioned the lining in 1921 to 25, we relined the entire tunnel, all 26,000 feet of it. In 1959, the second track was removed to allow clearances for intermodal traffic. Uh, there was there's a couple been a couple of fires in there since then um, because the diesels were of age and, and uh, uh, some of the fuel systems causing the fire. And so this what you see here is the one of the diesels that we have now running the fans. This is not what the original diesel looked like. It was a much bigger four cylinder diesel um, that ran on buffer seas. I said this is, runs on the conventional diesel number two diesel fuel. With the coming of the Rogers Pass project, which I'll describe in a minute, uh, we actually had the opportunity to get power to this location. And at that point, we put an electric motor on the normal uh, ventilation side of it. And you can see here, this is the electric motor. This is a uh, geared fluid coupling gear reduction. And the shaft goes through this wall here. And on the other side is the actual scroll cage fan. You can see here the switch gear for that uh, motor control system as we speak. Now we are currently in, in the process of changing this out to a, a variable frequency drive, which will enable us to control the fans at a much higher degree of precision. But I mentioned Rogers Pass. That's that was the next big thing. Uh, it didn't really the operation of uh, in Rogers Pass didn't really change until uh, the 1980s when the Rogers Pass project was completed. It was recognized in the 70s going on that traffic had a potential amount of increase um, on the horizon for CP and we needed to increase our capacity in the line. Uh, this had a lot to do with the uh, gross nest pass rates for grain and such in Canada. And at the time, um, it was sort of a deal struck with the government that we would be able to build this project uh, if those rates would be um, essentially deregulated and allowed CP to, to uh, recoup costs for the rates and what well, the result of that is the new mcdonald track which you see here uh again going through mount mcdonald and on a much much lower grade and you can tell this is even a lower grade than is on the uh, not side so basically what cp does in operating with the mountain here is all of the westbound traffic which is typically loaded trains loaded coal loaded grain loaded potash and so forth traveled on the McDonald track, where all of the eastbound traffic, which is lighter and um, more prone to a normal operation downhill, goes on the, the Connaught track. And so the Connaught track with 1% grade rolling through the tunnel is a, is a, a, has changed in terms of its um, use over time, only because of the way uh, we need to operate that tunnel. Rogers Pass project actually cost about $500 million. It was originally projected to cost $600 million. It's a new 21 and a quarter mile alignment. It, it includes the Mount McDonald Tunnel, as I mentioned before. It's 9.2 miles long. It's the longest rail tunnel in the Western Hemisphere. And there are other features of the project that are a little bit less sexy, I guess you could say, but are nonetheless very, very important. One is the Mount McDonald, or Mount Tronacy Tunnel, excuse me. It's very close to Mount McDonald Tunnel. It's about a mile long, but uh, it does have its, uh, a small ventilation system in it as well. There's one signal siding. There's one large viaduct. Um, the interesting thing about the viaduct was one of the restrictions we had from Parks Canada was we could only operate a strip of land 98 feet wide to build this railroad. And that's quite a, uh, a task to do in the mountainous region because if you're doing cuts on the side of the mountain, you're going to affect much more than 98 feet. So one of the solutions was to build a large viaduct in a section where the, the slope of the hill is so great that we need to do that. That large viaduct is about 4,700 feet long. And it's on concrete piers and it's pretty sure a um, concrete viaduct uh, the whole way. One of the other Feature of the line was a 40 mile long transmission line. We actually bring up power to the vent building to run the ventilation system from Revelstoke, which is about 40 miles long. It parallels roughly our right of way all the way. It's an open wire pole line at the moment. 
And uh, when we get into some of the details of you know, what we're doing now to upgrade the systems, you'll see how that's uh, playing into things. I mentioned the typical operation that we have now, the, the westbound trains uh, operating to the tunnel, the Mount Rodella tunnel, the eastbound traffic using the Knot. We also run all of our passenger traffic if there isn't a to the Knot tunnel as well. Construction took about four years. And I know there's a lot of civil engineers here, so I'll say that we, the 88 million cubic feet of earth and rock that was moved uh, is a pretty big number. And uh, there are some pits and stuff around the construction site that we built in because of that. And uh, uh, But we complied with all of the requirements that Park Canada had. In fact, if you drive the Trans Canada Highway there, there's only a few places you can even see the line. And the ventilation building is quite a bit far from uh, Trans Canada Highway, and you can't see it. And uh, fair enough, I'll show you a picture of it here. This is the building here. It's painted brown to blend in with the, the surrounding area. And it gives us uh, a, a very nice building to have over our ventilation shaft. It's actually in the, over the center of the shaft that goes down 1,200 feet into the mountain valley from the side. You can see in the top photo there is our backup generator. Uh, it's actually a 20 cylinder 710 diesel from EMD. And it's very similar to what you'd see at a, at an SD60 or so, or, or an SD70, uh, except it's got a few more cylinders to it. We can't run all the fans that we have off that diesel, but we can certainly keep the, the trains running with, with that very easily. The ventilation system includes an interface to our signal system so we know where the trains are and we can time where they are, how long it takes for them to get from one point to another so we know the speeds. And this is often uh, feed on five constant speed variable pitch rate fans. Um, four are in the ventilation house that you see here, and one is in the east portal. In addition to that, there's uh, ventilation gates. You can see here is the east portal gate. There's actually two of them. They're redundant, so you can have a backup if you need to do maintenance on one or just rotate their use. This middle picture is actually the middle gate. There's another gate in the middle of the tunnel, right at where the ventilation shaft is, so we can separate the tunnel into two separate ventilation areas. And we've also uh, installed many of these uh, dampers around the doors and around the pits themselves to allow us to equalize the pressure around the doors as they open and close. There's quite a bit of uh, work that has to be done in terms of opening and closing the door and it's all controlled by a PLC and a server that's at the location and it's controlled locally here in Ryan and Calgary. Over the years we've also installed some haze and gas detectors to measure things like NO2 and other things so that we can monitor the purge of the air in the tunnel so that we can purge it as soon as we can and operate the next train with the increase of capacity. There's also two man lifts. Uh, you can see one of them here that operate from the vent house all the way down to the tunnel. So you can actually go down to 1,200 feet. Uh, we're, we're working on upgrading them as well as, it, as we speak. And in the tunnel itself, every half mile is a refuse bay. And this is a picture of what one of those looks like. They're used for a lot of different functions. They're um, a place where a crew can be trained and, and find a safe haven if, if need be when they're in the tunnel. There's extra equipment in there like rebreathers and buckles and, and air hoses and stuff, and whatever they would need in case it's a problem in the tunnel itself. We also use it for other reasons. You can see here, this is a, uh, it's a switch gear for our 4,160 volt power system that's in the tunnel. It feeds down from the vent building down into the tunnel and then, uh, goes both ways to each, each of the portals. It operates, it, it powers the signal system and also powers the lighting that's in the tunnel itself. Um, so let me give you an idea of how the ventilation system works. Um, it, it's a fairly complex process, but I tried to boil it down in, in as, a few steps as I can. Unfortunately, there's a lot of varying variances to this, and it depends on train speed, it depends on air temperature, it 
of the tunnel, um, bed billing, and several other factors. But in essence, this is what happens. Uh, a westbound train enters a tunnel and it is uh, feeding off fresh air that's in the tunnel. As it, you can also see that the mid gate is down at this point. So now we've got essentially two separate air systems in the tunnel, blanketed uh, by the east side and the west side. And the tunnel shaft, it's, the ventilation shaft itself is divided into the concrete divider so that there's only ways, the only way that these fans can operate is to work on the east side of the tunnel, and these fans only work on the west side. As the train fully enters the tunnel, the east gate is closed. The train is still traveling westbound and using air that's been uh, in the tunnel as we speak. We're using the piston effect to force air along the length of the tunnel so mid-train distributed power or power at the end of the train will still receive fresh air. One of the nuances of this is that the ventilation system isn't designed to provide fresh air for breathing for human consumption. It's only there to provide cooling air for the locomotives to keep the train moving. So it's an important thing. The temperature that we have to monitor the air at is very, very important. If the temperature rises too much, the efficiency of the locomotives go down. In fact, they can even shut down if the air intake air gets too hot. If that happens, the train will further deteriorate in speed and actually could even stall. So it's very, very important if this ventilation system is working. As the train approaches the midpoint of the tunnel, we open the gate, allow it to come through. It's still working on fresh air that's been in the tunnel for a while. And the east side is now uh, in need of, need of a purge because there's a lot of exhaust air in there and the temperature's very hot. So in the next step, um, the train still using the fresh air that it uh, sees coming through its, um, the tunnel. As soon as it clears the midpoint of the tunnel, the ventilation shaft, we close that door again. We fire up the fans in the ventilation house and begin a purge to the east side. And the train's still in the tunnel. Remember, this is a, a nine mile tunnel, so we can fit the train here very easily. So this purge air starts to follow through and eliminate and evacuate the air that's uh, in there and cool the temperature in that east side of the tunnel. If needed, other fans can be brought online to increase this uh, airflow, depending on the conditions that are there. But this is generally what happens. Once the train leaves the tunnel, we can start purging the west side. The west side is used. Uh, again, the gate is still closed. These fans are initiated. Purge air is brought in all the way through the tunnel. Now, while this is happening, this has already been purged. We are now ready to enter the next train. So we can actually have a train enter the east side while we're purging the west side. So we've got a, 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 an absolute optimized system for running train capacity through the tunnel. This is what the dispatcher sees. We call it uh, RTC, our rail traffic controllers. You can see here, this is the Mount McDonald Tunnel on the lower track. This is the McDonald track. The upper track is the uh, canal track. The unique thing about this thing is that our tracks actually cross each other while they're in both tunnels. Uh, the canal tunnel is higher than the McDonald Tunnel, so the McDonald Tunnel actually passes under the track while it's in the canal tunnel as well. So even though they come up on one side as they enter the tunnel, they're on the opposite side of the main line when they come out of the tunnel. So we can see here the indications of the doors, the, the gates that we have in the tunnel, and whether the tunnel is actually in a state of purge or not. This is sort of a, a test screen that we had showing some alarm from the testing time. This was occurring. This is what the maintenance screen looks like uh, for the system that operates the tunnel itself. There's a few interesting points we want to make out here. Uh, one is the fans. This is the uh, vent building itself with four fans. This is the McDonald tunnel here, and you can see the gates. And then one fan number one, which is in the east portal. You should notice here that these are all are at idle right now. These fans are not being used for anything to push air in the tunnel at all. But yet they're still drawing 70 
to 80 amperes of power at 4100 volts AC. So you can imagine there's a lot of power being used here. So as I mentioned, we're controlling flow of air with the pitch of the blades, not the rotational speed of the fan. Uh, that's a major problem for us in terms of uh, um, maintenance because this means that the, the fan's being used all the time. We have to actually take one of these motors out each year and completely rebuild it. Uh, and that gives us uh, about a five-year life on, on a motor that runs continuously. So we're looking at new ways to, to optimize that as well. But it gives you an idea of what our if, you know, if we could um, eliminate the always on feature of these fans and shut them off between trains when we don't use them, we feel we could save about 50% of our electricity bill, which currently is about $160,000 a month. So there's a, there's a tremendous amount of operating expense we can save if we upgrade the you know, control of the fans themselves. I mentioned you can see the gates here, uh, they're redundant, and we graphically show which way they're up or down. They are uh, counterweighted, so if they fail, they fail up automatically. So we want to run the train to you know, uh, get the people out of there if we need to, if there's a problem with the gates. These circles show you the, the control of the Shaughnessy Tunnel. Um, Shaughnessy Tunnel is very simple. It just turns on when there's a train in the tunnel and it shuts off so many minutes afterwards. There's several jet fans in the roof of the tunnel. And uh, we don't need them all at any one particular time, but uh, this gives you an idea of how many are available and, and how they run. Since they're on the power system that um, comes up on the fall line from Rebel Soap, uh, we can control that power from this location as well. In, in Calgary. And finally, you can see the Kanawha Tunnel. Uh, since you know we, we do have uh, automated functions there. We know where the trains are in the, via the track circuits from the signal system, so we can turn the fans on when we need them. And the, there's also a remote control for the diesel fan if you ever need to fire up the roots of diesel itself. This gives you an idea of everything that's going on in the tunnel. Uh, we can also uh, check the utility line coming in. We can check the generator if it's on. You can see it's not currently on right now. Uh, we can check system parameters like temperature in the tunnel itself. Uh, you can also know the train configuration. Depending on what type of train it is, might change how we simulate the tunnel itself. Uh, originally, we had a lot of problems with wood chips. Um, if we had a solid block of wood chips in the train and we turned the fans on, we'd actually lose half the load because the wood chips would blow out all over the tunnel. Uh, that still happens with coal trains. Uh, we do have to uh, clean the tunnel every year. Um, see if it's free of coal dust. It, it, it does accumulate in the tunnel quite a bit. And it's one of the maintenance things that we have to do every year. So in effect, since it was built, there's been no real major capital um, programs since then. Uh, but we're sitting on a situation where all of these systems are about the same age because they were built uh, at the same time. The power line is actually the oldest system. It was completed in 1984 because we needed to have power for the construction. And, um, you know, 30 years is a long time for trees to start growing up in the fall line that we have and um, to overrun some of the things that we do in terms of ventilation system and you know, access to the you know, different locations along the line. Um, we do replace the PLCs about once every 10 years. That's a limit on the support that we get from the manufacturer and they're constantly upgrading their machines so they don't support the old ones for very long. We've also installed extra sensors in there to try to manage our purge times a little bit and see if we can be a little bit more efficient in there at this point. Uh, so but this left us with a problem. We've got a lot of older systems in there now. Um, and so in 2018 we initiated a condition assessment of all the systems. Uh, due to the fact that we were having a lot of failures in the power line coming up from level slope and uh, several other unique failures we hadn't really seen before, so we wanted to make sure that we knew what was going on with the parent and so forth. The picture on the, that you can see here is a uh, is, um, uh, cap lines off the 35 kV line coming up from level slope, and you can see the scarring that was in there. This is after it was repaired, but uh, 
these lines are getting old. They've been in service for 35 or more years, and the insulation is starting to break down. So uh, this actually flashed over and caused an outage on our line. So we also want to look at this from a systems perspective. How do we not just rebuild, how do we make it better? And that's some of the things that we look at over time. The result of the analysis was that we've created over 130 projects over a multi-year plan. Hopefully we'll do, be able to finish it in six years, but I think it's going to get stretched up to seven or eight at this point because we're a little bit scarred on capital for the program. Um, we're hoping that this will extend the life of all the systems another 30 years. We did take a look at safe, uh, life safety in the tunnel itself. Uh, just make sure that all the systems are, are up and compatible with our risk analysis. We have installed fiber optic cable in the tunnel. All the communications prior to that was on uh, coax or copper lines, and their reliability wasn't uh, very good, so we wanted to improve that. And we've also uh, had a program to replace all the leaky coax in the tunnel. Now, the leaky coax is really a radiating element for a radio so that we can run our distributed power and train devices and voice communications farther in the tunnel. Um, if you're in the middle of the tunnel, if you're four and a half miles from the portal, no radio system is going to work in there unless you put in some sort of uh, leaky coax system. Uh, one of the big Part of the projects is to renew Downey Street substation. This is where we get our power from DC Hydro in Revelstoke. It's a, obviously at the end of Downey, uh, Downey Street in Revelstoke itself. All of the switch gear is due for replacement. And you can see on the right here uh, a pad mount transformer. And um, although it's, it's, it's serviceable and, and, and operates um, well, uh, it's, it's showing signs of wear and it's time to look at that to see what we need to do. There. We also want to replace the 4100 volt AC distribution system in the tunnel. We saw that uh, switch here in the refuse phase. All of that is subject to a tremendous amount of uh, stress from the coal dust and uh, humidity in the, temp in, in the tunnel itself and water penetration within some of the, the, the rooms itself. So these, these the switch gear in the tunnel is. Uh, Basically, seeing some better days, and we want to replace all of that as well, as well as all the lighting in the tunnel, and also to uh, keep the manlets in a state of good repair. Um, this is a picture of the sh of the uh, west portal of Shaughnessy Tunnel. You can see here in the little shed next to it is the switch gear that controls the fans inside the tunnel. Uh, all of this is slated for renewal and replacement as well. And we're also looking at a, a, a gas sensor system inside the tunnel and, and also in all of the tunnels in Western Canada that, uh, of any length that would detect um, hazardous conditions for train crews so that if there's a derailment or a situation in the tunnel with a leaking car or something, we can inform the crew that it's safe or not safe to go into the tunnel to, to help um, do a condition assessment of the tunnel. There's several large projects associated with the multi-year plan for Rogers Pass, and, and I'd like to go through those right now. One is the 35 kV transmission line. I mentioned before that after 30 years of service, the trees have begun to grow up uh, close to the power line. They're actually in the power line in, in some areas, and that's causing us to have outages as we go. Um, this is a picture of coal number zero. This is where it starts in Revelstoke, and you can see it's a, a, just a three-phase um, delta connected line that, that travels along the right-of-way. And uh, the intent is to completely uh, replace this line with a new underground cable, uh, the entire length. And so we will have um, eliminated all of the threats to either wildlife or you know, the trees and brush that's going up underneath the pole line. And so we won't have, we'll eliminate that problem altogether and really increase our reliability on the pole line. Another one is the variable frequency drives. I mentioned that in the uh, Canot Tunnel. Uh, it's really just newer technology. When the tunnel was built in 1988, uh, the, the constant speed motor with the variable pitch drive was really the, the technology of the day. And it's changed quite a bit in the last 30 years. We can actually control 
very high horsepower motors with electronics now. So we can actually turn them on and off when we want. Uh, we can vary the speed of the train or the, the fan to adjust the amount of um, ventilation we need for the tunnel. We couldn't do that in 1988 when it was built. Um, we do have a, a precise control of the fans, but only through uh, the hydraulics, which you can see here and further up here, the control of the, the uh, fan blades in the, in the machine itself. What you see here, this is the motor itself. This is a 2250 horsepower motor. The shaft goes through here. This is the this is fan number two, or see, yeah, fan two. So we're actually sucking in air from the upper part of the building. The fan is here, and it forces it through here. And this concrete structure actually is the interface into the shaft itself, which is just behind this wall, and it goes straight down uh, to the McDonald Hall and and out the other end. We want to change out these motors in this drive with a variable frequency, variable voltage drive, which means we can soft start the motors anytime we want. Right now, it's not recommended to shut down the motor at any time because uh, the starting current uh, and voltages on the motor are, are detrimental to their long life. So that's why they're on all the time. We can control that now with modern electronics. So we're hoping to extend the motor life to at least 10 years, perhaps, if we can, and also lower our power consumption greatly, like I mentioned before. You see here, this is the upper part of the, of the building itself. The second floor of the building is actually a huge plenum and a large uh, inertial air filter. It's got to come over a wall and come back into this room that we're seeing here. So this is actually right above, this part here is right above what you saw before, right above here. So we're sucking the air in and pushing it into the tunnel. Here is a sample of what the blades look like. We have to actually re replace the blades every year or so on certain fans to see a lot of thirds because these blades, the leading edge of the blade wears quite a bit, particularly on the plan, on the fans that suck the air because we're bringing up the coal dust with it. And that coal dust is very abrasive and actually wears down these blades very quickly. So the VFD, we're, we're hoping to not only lower our energy costs from operation, but also to increase the efficiency of the fans themselves. Uh, one minor mistake that was made when the, the uh, tunnel was designed was that the uh, air resistance of the tunnel itself was a little bit miscalculated. So we may be able to increase our fan efficiency by up to 40% from the original design. So that's a study that's currently ongoing. And we hope to have those results uh, in the middle of next year so we can start our formal design for the VFDs and uh, increase our efficiency. I mentioned PLC replacements. It's something that has been going about every 10 years. We're certainly currently replacing all of our IO subsystems in those PLCs. Uh, but once we go to a VFD, we may need to change out our PLC control as well. Um, it's just something that happens. Uh, we use Allen Bradley devices out there now, and uh, we may continue to do so, but um, when we designed for the VFD, we we'll, we'll possibly change things. So it's a part of another major upgrade that we're, we're, we're considering. So in the end, you know, the, our main line is very important to us. It's, it's a, really the heart and soul of CP. If you look at the train density, you, you'd understand it. Uh, there's very few times uh, you can go on a track out there and not see a train. Um, it's great if you want to take pictures. It's, it's great for the treasure of the CP. And, uh, we want to continue that. We want to increase our capacity as much like, as, as we can. Right now, the tunnel, tunnel is our, our, our pinch point for westbound capacity. It currently takes us 25 to 35 minutes to purge the east side of the tunnel. And then we want to see if we can increase that or decrease that time and make it possible to increase our capacity. So um, as we look to the future, all these systems upgrades that we're looking at will perform those functions for us. And we're looking at it from a holistic standpoint, not just a replacing time type of uh, situation. So in the end, we're hoping that this uh, brings us uh, a much higher capacity and also a much better uh, uh, lower cost of operations as we go forward.
And uh, with that, I, I turn it back over to Chris for any questions anybody has, and I appreciate uh, your time and listening to my, my presentation. Well, thank you, David. That was outstanding. And um, I have a better appreciation for why a guy with systems and controls expertise uh, is talking about a, you know, a tunnel such as this. So yeah, we do. Uh, we have. A... Go ahead. It does sorry. seem kind of strange that uh, it, it seems like on CP anything with an electron in, it in the field falls under S and C, which is fine. And we, we certainly enjoy the challenge. It's unusual for a signal engineer to be looking at tunnel stuff, but it's, it's, it has been very interesting. So we have a question. Um, does the operation of the tunnels require on-site staffing uh, at all times, especially in the winter, or can it be done remotely? It can all be done remotely. Uh, there's enough maintenance and upgrades that are going on at any one time. There's usually someone in the event building. Uh, Normally, I would say much less likely to have somebody at East Florida. Okay. Well, I had a question myself, which um, you partially answered, but I wouldn't mind if you could expand upon it a little bit. So, um, you know, I think a lot of people would probably think, you know, you were talking about how the fans run all the time. And, um, you know, a lot of people's reaction to that was, well, just turn them off when you don't have a train coming. But you spoke a little bit to why you can't do that. Could you expand on that a little bit for us non-electrical engineers? Sure. And when you start a big motor like that, the inrush current is very great. And back in the day, there wasn't really a, a way to do that very often. And so what happens is when you start a motor like that, the windings sort of get a real... Um, the, the surge in current and the sudden jolt is, is mechanically tough on the motor. So if you do that very often, you'll actually tear it up. So it's meant to be on all the time. That was the whole point of it. And being that that was the case with such a large motor, that's why they went with the variable pitch band blades to control the So it's on all the time. And we can control the ramp up by slowly changing the pitch which increases the current of the motor, but it's not a sudden thing. It's controlled over several seconds, so it's not really a problem. Uh, nowadays, see. we have electronic controls that can vary not only the voltage, but the frequency, which is very key to an AC motor, because if you know anything about AC motors, they are tied to the frequency of the power that powers them. So they are rotating strictly on what frequency you put into them. And they'll try to draw as much current as they can to maintain that. So if you can change that frequency, you can change the amount of inrush current coming into the motor. So you can actually soft start it very easily. Okay. Well, the questions are pouring in now. Let me uh, get to them. Uh, does the cold pose any challenges with the tunnel, such as snow, ice, air density, et cetera? <clears throat> uh, once you get about 200 feet into the tunnel, the air temperature is about constant for the entire length of the tunnel. Um, so we don't get any freezing in the tunnel. Uh, it's kept, it, 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 the temperature is, is above freezing. Um, the problem with the coal dust is it accumulates in areas where there's water penetration in the tunnel. And uh, there are areas where you can get into several inches of muck that you have to walk through if you have to be in the tunnel, and uh, which is not a very pleasant experience. It's like being covered in crater compound or something like that. It's, it's just a mess. Yeah. <laughs> it gets to be a, a, a hazard at some point if you don't clean up. That's why we have a constant uh, program to clean the tunnel every year or so. And the refuse bays are the same thing. If you saw the picture, uh, that was just before it was cleaned. And there was probably an inch of mud on the floor there. And it's not really mud. It's a mixture of, of, of slurry of coal and potash and anything else that goes to the tunnel and it, it's it's not something it's um, not going to plug the tunnel up but it's it, it, it's very difficult to walk in if you're very careful in the room.
So another question is, uh, does CP get involved with avalanche control along these rail lines? Absolutely. We absolutely do. We have our own. I, it's not something I do I'm involved with personally. We have our own crews that set off uh, charges at various places to promote avalanches so we feel line. Um, in addition to that, uh, we are parallel along a lot of areas with the um, Transcanada Highway, and they do avalanche control as well, so we have to be involved in that. Um, there are several areas, particularly just west of the McDonald Tunnel, that uh, all CP employees require avalanche training um, to be on the property at all. And, uh, uh, it's something that uh, we take really seriously. Okay. Uh, um, here's another question. Has CP considered adding the electrification as originally proposed? I've never heard of anybody talking about it. I don't think anyone's left that understands that the tunnel is actually high enough to put a canary wire in there. Um, I think the problem is now um, that when you look at the precision scheduled railroad, um, you really don't want to stop a train to put on different edges at a certain part, point in time. Uh, our trains are much, much longer than they've ever been before. And uh, we use the truly of power. Um, on virtually every train now on the main line. So, um, and the diesel engines are so large now and so common that I, I don't think that the economics would, would, would pay off in anyway. Okay. This next question is a, kind of a capacity related question. Um, What's the dwell time between, or maybe the interval time between trains traveling through the tunnel, and does um, does the ventilation system constrain capacity? Well, the ventilation system defines the capacity in the tunnel. Uh, in the summertime, when we have everything in operation, we can get a purge time of about 24, 25 minutes, and that defines when we can allow the next train into the east part of the tunnel. One of the things that we want to study now is to see if we can increase our fan efficiency, if we can lower that. Um, when we purge the tunnel, it's not an environment that you could sustain human life in. It's like being in a hurricane. It's quite, quite impressive. But you have to understand you have to clear four and a half miles of tunnel space. And it takes a long time to do that. And these trains that operate on, on the grade are only doing generally 15 to 17 miles an hour. And you know, it, it takes 30 minutes or so to traverse the tunnel at that speed anyway. So, um, you know, it, it is the impediment to the capacity of the entire line as far as westbound traffic. But um, in the end, uh, it, it's, it's not a major thing. Trains are held up sometimes for, but generally they, they get a clear signal over the train. We run about 170 or so million gross tons a year on that line, so it is pretty busy. Yeah, so I guess the basic question is, what is, are you running close to capacity there these days or not? I think there's some more in there. Uh, it, you know, we, anyone that tries to get any track back for maintenance on the mountain will tell you that there's no time for anything. But, uh, uh, yeah, it, it, it comes in spurts. I mean, we don't fleet trains, but uh, um, there, is, there is some more capacity, for sure. Okay. Um, next question is, are there lessons learned for systems and ventilation that might be applied to the Windsor Tunnel, obviously recognizing it's a different environment? Yeah, the Windsor Tunnel is a uh, bottomed out tunnel where you, you downhill the first half and up to the second. Uh, in, in either direction. So it's a little bit of a different situation. We're uphill the entire length of the tunnel, so the trains are pulling hard no matter what. And um, in the winter, winter tunnels are shorter as well. Um, so the, the ventilation models you would use and are, are quite a different. The winter tunnel is also bi directional. We can run in either direction in the McDonald tunnel, we just don't need to. Uh, it makes more sense to do what we're doing anyway. So, 
Um, there was, we had we have lots of visitors that come out to see the tunnel. It's, uh, particularly one that comes to mind was uh, an Australian group that came. They're building a, a tunnel um, in South Eastern Australia that's about the same length as our tunnel. And um, I think they were happy to see what we did and they were actually modeling what we could do because they don't have much higher capacity than, than uh, normally attributed because they're running past the van freight train. So, um, you know, there's lots of learnings of how we do things. Uh, we've changed a few things in how we do it. The base design is actually very good and has uh, stood for the test of time. But again, we'd like to upgrade the uh, technology and try to see what we can do to lower the first thing. Okay. Um, next question is, um, are the tunnel doors checked to be in the open position by the signal system for approaching trains? Yes, they are. They pull in the locks. Uh, the issue is, though, that we cannot, uh, within the braking pattern of the train, even going uphill, the tunnel has to be closed uh, until the train is very close to it. So if there are signals right at the doors themselves. Um, it's just something that uh, you have to live with. Normally, you'd expect a signal engineer to sit there and say, well, the tunnel door has to be open if we're going to line a signal through it, but we, we can't do that because the ventilation system wouldn't work if we did that. Uh, the doors themselves are very large and very heavy, but they are made to be crashed through if need be. They're made of uh, a steel frame with plywood sides to it, so it's it's not something that would be the end of the world if they had to crash through one anyway. So that's kind of a risk mitigation for that. Okay. Um, would the the current clearance of the tunnel permit double tracking if traffic was to warrant that? No. Would, would notching uh, or uh, the tunnel sides as some other roads have done solve that problem or is it more significant than that? No, it would be a much more significant issue. It, 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 you can, I don't know if you're still seeing the slides, but go back and yeah, you, we can see the slides. The tunnel portal itself. Um, this is a single track tunnel for sure, and and the Shaughnessy tunnel is also the same way. If you look at that, uh, they picture the portal here. Which yeah, right there. That's a single track floor as well. That would take a significant uh, right. change to, to make them. Okay. Um, next question is, how do you manage the risk of power outages? Well, the, the, the power outage itself is it's unique in that uh, we have DC hydro customers on our power line. Um, so we have agreements with DC Hydros that you know, capital expenditures and so forth that, that were required for the line. Um, if the tunnel, if the power goes down, it, it, it stops a lot of things, but it doesn't stop us from moving trains. The Kanaw tunnel has a backup diesel that operates one fan, it's all we need, so it's okay. The Shaughnessy tunnel, the jet fans would fail, but being at a mile long, it's it's not terribly uh, difficult. If we're going to slow the number of trains going through there, we can live with that. Uh, we just have to let the tunnel sit a little bit longer between trains. The McDonald Tunnel Vent House has that large generator. There's actually two generators in the McDonald Tunnel Vent House. One is the big one you saw, the EMV 710 engine. The other one is a smaller um, eight-cylinder diesel that runs the controls, whereas the the big railroad diesel operates with you know, supplies power through fans. So with both of those running, we can actually run trains uh, fairly well. We can operate up to three fans. And typically we only need uh, three fans to run trains in any case. So we feel pretty confident. That, and we, we do it quite an awful lot when we're doing maintenance on the line, we want to fire the diesel up and, and uh, run under, under, under diesel power. So 
having the power line down is an inconvenience, but it doesn't stop us from doing it. Okay. A couple of questions related to use of alternative propulsion technology. So uh, one of them is, does the uh, cold ambient temperatures or the mountain topography and weather uh, have any potential implications on possible use of battery electric or fuel cell powered locomotives? Well, that's an interesting question. We are currently, um, we currently have an internal project in a different department to look at the hydrogen fuel cell locomotives. Um, so obviously um, some of the constraints that you would have for that would be you want an engine that could essentially replace the diesel that we have now in terms of length of uh, service run and horsepower and so forth. So we're, we're just on the beginning of that program right now. Um, so we don't really have any results for that. Uh, there's a lot of other programs out there besides ours looking at the fuel cell. Um, I know that from the CP perspective, we are originally going to look at um, natural gas powered engines, but um, we were convinced early on that it was better to go with something that was non-fossil fuel altogether. And, and, you know, so just cut to the chase. And, and do the right thing with the first shot rather than stage it. So that that process is ongoing. And we just don't have the results yet. Okay. Kind of a related question is that um, if you were using um, fuel cells or hydrail locomotives, would that uh, either reduce ventilation system costs or increase capacity? Well, if, you know, capacity is all about horsepower. Uh, in terms of how the train operates. Um, if we went to a hydrogen fuel cell locomotive, there wouldn't be any exhaust. We would need the, uh, the ventilation system so we could shut it down. Yeah, I think that I think that's the questioner's point is that is that the um, there would be some economic advantages in that regard. That you'd gain capacity and reduce um, the ventilation costs. Right, right. And and we, we could gain capacity, but again it's it's uh, Function of the horsepower per ton as far as how it runs in the tunnel. So, uh, if, the, if the fuel cell locomotives don't match what we can do in terms of providing horsepower from the diesel, then uh, there's some, some takeaways from that as well. So. And another capacity related question and you know, what are some ideas that you guys are pursuing or plans uh, to improve the ventilation system to increase capacity? Well, I think I, I mentioned most of what we're looking at. We're trying to increase fan efficiency. Uh, if we can increase that, we can pump more air into the tunnel. The CFM capacity of the fans themselves is, is a function of, of the fan motor uh, size, the blade size, and all that stuff. So that's all going to change significantly with the VFD drive uh, console. I think. Uh, We've already installed some sensors in there so we can monitor things. Originally, the design called for just an exchange of air. It was designed to exchange 110% of the volume of air that's in the tunnel at any one time. So once we had done that, then we would clear the purge and allow another train to run. We do a little bit differently now where we actually monitor the air and see if it's located on another train. So uh, that's helped us out. We've got it down to like 24 minutes at times. Um, but again, there's other issues as well. Uh, one of the problems that was encountered early on was the normal uh, use of the vent fans on the east side, pushing air from the vent building through the shaft uh, when it was uh, very cold, and it does get very cold up there. When it hit the warm air in the tunnel, it would cause ice buildup from the moisture in the outside air, and that ice built up on the line of the vent shaft and eventually it would break off and fall down and damage parts of the tunnel. So we have a different winter purge setup now where we only use the east portal vein in those cases when the temperature is below minus five degrees centigrade. So uh, that does impact our capacity somewhat, but uh, again, it, 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 uh, 
uh, with the newer diesels we have, we found that it's it's not a, a terrible impact to our operations. Okay, um, and we're running. We appreciate you taking the time to answer all these questions. I think we'll answer. We'll address the last two here. Do um, you have any comments on the Crow's Nest Pass line? Um, and did CP have a route to the coast west of Cranbrook? No, it uh, it doesn't go that far. Um, all the coal and rain that comes from that side of DC and Alberta have to come up the uh, either the Windermere sub or the Alderside sub to get on the main line to come to the Chicago Tunnel to get to Vancouver. Okay. And the last question, we're back to hydrogen fuel cells again. Um, the questioner is observing that, that they too use oxygen. So would that, would it still require a ventilation system to some extent? Well, uh, all tunnels have some natural ventilation to them. Um, we can actually run trains downhill in the McDonald tunnel without the ventilation system at all. For two or three runs without any impact or anything. So, you know, air itself is always brought in there. It, it's, a, it's a pressure thing. If you use air, it'll, it'll, it'll just bring more air in. Um, that's something that we have to find out. We don't know exactly how much uh, air the, the, the hydrogen fuel cell would use. Um, it, it's actually, um, you know, the, the, most of those use cells operate on pure O2, so if we have to um, use that, that's one way of doing it. If they're using this outside air, uh, we may have to put air into it. That would change quite a bit as how, how we operate the ventilation system, but I don't think it would be a situation where we have to force as much air as we normally do to purge the cycles, so to speak. Okay. Well, Dave, I want to thank you again. Um, this is an outstanding seminar in several respects. One of the things I like about it is how multidisciplinary we've talked about civil engineering, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, and operations um, research. And they're all, it's a great illustration of how all of these things are so intertwined in many uh, types of railroad operations and engineering. And so I um, really appreciate you taking the time to present all this and uh, answer all these questions. And I also want to thank all of the members of the audience for your participation, as well as um, uh, the many interesting questions we got. So with that, I will uh, wish everybody the very best for the upcoming holiday season. And um, thank you again, Dave. And um, you know, invite everybody to come back in the spring, well, actually in February, when we will restart the Hay Railroad Engineering Seminar Series. So have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you very much.